Well, one thing that we have talked about several times since starting our study in Daniel is how easy it is for us to think about Daniel as basically being two books. That there are those two sections. There's the one section that we pretty well already dealt with. Those are those familiar, inspiring stories about how God's people remained faithful during difficult and trying circumstances and how God was with them in the midst of that. Um, we, many of us, have learned those stories. You know, we learned them back when we were preschoolers, Daniel and the lion's den, those very familiar uh, stories. Then there's the other part of the book of Daniel, those unfamiliar visions and dreams that are, are more difficult for us to wrap our minds around that are a lot easy for, easier for us to just kind of skip over. Uh, in fact, most often in past times when we studied the book of Daniel, we just kind of hit the high points and skip over uh, the sections that we're fixing to get into. Uh, and it's, it's easy for us to do that, to just kind of push the, uh, the visions and the dreams off to the side, thinking, well, that was just something for back then. Uh, these, all these apocalyptic visions, that, that was meaningful to them, but what does that really have to say to us? It was helpful to me just this past week as I was preparing for the lesson. I've been reading some essays by N.T. Wright, who is a uh, brilliant theologian, primarily a New Testament scholar. But one essay I was reading, he was talking a lot about the book of Daniel as in terms of how the first century was looking at that book and how they understood it and what the Jews of Jesus' time understood about this. And Wright's thesis was that the whole book of Daniel really has a unifying theme, and that is that uh, God is going to vindicate his people. That's true if we're looking at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, or Daniel in the lion's den. It's also true as we look into these dreams and visions. Um, the, the familiar stories, the stories like uh, chapter one and chapter three, chapter six, those are obviously about how God is there with his people in the fiery furnace, in the den of lions, uh, at the king's table, wherever it is they're facing challenges, God is there. And even the, the dreams that we have already read about, where it was primarily about how God was going to bring judgment on some wicked pagan kings uh, there in chapter four and five, that kind of fits as well that God, God sees what's going on and God is going to intervene. According to Wright, all of that really just sets the tone and, and sets the table for these further visions that we're going to read now. Uh, and then the final deliverance that we will get to in chapter 12. They all contribute to this common idea that there is one God who is going to establish his reign over the wicked nations as well as over his people. And that the faithful, vindicated people of God are going to, to share in that. That's how the first century Jews looked at the book of Daniel. They were, they were looking for that time, uh, particularly given their circumstance under Roman rule. They were eager for these dreams and visions of Daniel to, to come to pass for some of the things that he wrote about and talked about to happen because they wanted to see vindication. They wanted to see God's fingerprints uh, on history. And so today we're going to be looking at a challenging passage, uh, Daniel chapter seven. But as we do it, I, I want us to try to keep a big picture in mind, not to get lost in the weeds, 
because it's, it's really easy for us as we start reading these passages to try to start interpreting every single detail and trying to connect all of the dots. And it, it frankly, it gets pretty exhausting when you do that. And it's not that beneficial when you come right down to it. Um, just trying to identify every little detail of these dreams. But what does matter to us is the overall idea that God is the God of history, that God is in control. God reigns. He is sovereign. So let's begin by looking at verses one through eight of Daniel chapter seven, about four beasts. Daniel chapter seven, beginning in the first verse. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw my vision by night. The four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I watched, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being and human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth and was told, arise, devour many bodies. And after this, as I watched, another one appeared, like a leopard. This beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the vision by night, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces and stamping on what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it and had 10 horns. I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up from among them to make room for it. Three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn and a mouth speaking arrogantly. So all of that is certainly as clear as mud, I'm sure. Uh, but let's try to get into this a little bit. The, the, the first verse of this chapter establishes pretty early on that this is not following chronologically after what we've already read in chapter six. Rather, this goes back to that time between chapter four and chapter five in what is described as the first year of Belshazzar's reign. In other words, that, that first point when he began to govern as viceroy in the absence of his father, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. So that would have probably been around 553 or so BC. And Daniel describes this vision that in some ways um, is reminiscent of the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had back in chapter two. In that earlier dream, it was about this image that had, uh, was made out of four different types of metal and uh, it was describing four kingdoms. Well, once again, we see a, a vision about four kingdoms but this time it is described in terms of four beasts. And it begins with this picture of the unruly sea. And, and out of that sea, these beasts emerge. That is a familiar picture in the Old Testament, not the part about the beast, but about the unruly sea. Because again and again, all the way back to Genesis, the sea represented to the, the Hebrews the unknown, the, the chaotic, that which was out of their control. Uh, and it's out of this picture of chaos and evil that we see these four beasts come forth, representing four kingdoms or four empires. The first one is the one that we can establish as clearly, uh, the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. 
it's it's the one of the four that we can say pretty certainly okay this is what that means um it's it's about babylon it's more specifically even about the reign of nebuchadnezzar in fact the, even that imagery of the lion and the eagle those were used at that time as representative of nebuchadnezzar and so the combination of the two the lion the king of the beast and then the the eagle which of course is a majestic bird that it's our own national emblem uh it, it pictures this reign as being something exemplary something uh marvelous just like in that dream of nebuchadnezzar where nebuchadnezzar was the gold head uh the most precious of the, of all of the metals so now this is the the king of the beast this is the uh the king of the birds this is uh the best of the bunch in in many respects and it speaks of the power that nebuchadnezzar held because he was the longest reigning monarch of this powerful empire that the jewish people had lived under for all of these years now ever since the time of the exile began but we see the wings on the back of this beast that were not just clipped uh they were, they were plucked plucked like a chicken uh, and it, once it's all once it's all said and done then the beast gets up on his hind legs and walks off like a man and it's a, it's a picture of what seemed to be something fearsome really just ends up being mortal so it's a picture that in spite of the fact that babylon has been so dominant in spite of the fact that nebuchadnezzar was someone to be feared someone to be held as one that inspired all when it's all said and done it's just a man then there's the second beast and this is where it starts getting a little questionable as to what each of these means uh some interpreters look at this as the kingdom of the medes uh others look upon this as well it's the medo persian empire uh and if if the latter is the case then those three bones or three ribs or three tusks however you want to describe it in the mouth of the bear uh are sometimes understood as the the major conquests as the the medo-persian empire expanded first lydia then babylon then egypt um and the fact that it's a bear you know bears are powerful but they're slow moving or at least we think of them as being if one is chasing you it is not but but we tend to think of their they're, they're kind of lumbering they're uh they don't appear to be uh as fast moving as, as some animals uh particularly in contrast with the next beast which is described as a leopard but with four wings on its back and four heads which is an odd picture for us to even try to wrap our minds around but it's a picture of one that is fast moving uh it's one that is uh, on the move that is like it's just flying this is a pretty good representation perhaps of the persian empire uh particularly the the four heads as the the empire's four kings or it might be the greek empire because if you think about Alexander the Great uh, and the advances that he made, essentially he conquered the known world in about a decade, uh, in a brief period of time, he conquered everything imaginable. Uh, and then upon his death, at an early age, 32 or 33, the kingdom was divided into the four parts. Uh, each one ruled by one of his four generals. So either one of those applications could work. Take your pick. The fourth beast is described as being uh, different than all of the others. It was terrible and dreadful, which kind of fits the others in my estimation. But according to Daniel, this one was terrible and dreadful. Uh, 
and it had exceeding strength, had iron teeth, and had ten horns. Some interpreters look at this and say, well, if you, if you go down through those four generals that the kingdom of Alexander the Great was divided among, the Seleucid dynasty was one of them. Uh, that, they were the ones that forced Greek Hellenistic culture on everybody they conquered. And, and that particularly fits when you see a little horn growing out of this. And as we'll see in next week's lesson, that's pretty clearly identified with Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, uh, who was a terrible despot, a tyrant, uh, one who desecrated the, the uh, Jewish temple that had been rebuilt, uh, one who did all kinds of abominable things to the Jewish people. Again, we'll talk about that more next week, uh, but that would fit. Others look at this and say, well, it's the, the Roman Empire. I mean, when you think about power, when you think about the, the number 10, well, the 10 hills, it, it fits as well. Others look at this and say, well, no, this is some kind of a, a future prophecy. This is, has, has something to do with something at the end of time. Um, bottom line is we don't know. You know. And when you really get down to it, how these beasts are identified, uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of an impact on uh, how we're going to spend uh, Monday morning. It really doesn't have a whole lot of effect on our lives. But the principle here is something that's important to us. The key idea is the same one that we talked about back in chapter two. Kingdoms come and go. Empires rise and fall. None of that escapes God's notice. And none of it comes as a surprise to him. God is on the throne. The kingdoms of man can seem powerful. They can seem awe-inspiring. They can seem uh, fearful. You know, something that inspires fear in us. But they're transient. They're going to pass away. But God is all-powerful. And his kingdom is everlasting. So as we think about this, not worrying so much about the specific application of what these beasts would have meant to those who received the original prophecy of Daniel, but to think in our own lives, what are some, some pretty fearful beasts some, some frightening earthly powers or forces that might cause us or, or cause others to question whether God really is on the throne. What are some of the, the forces at work that we see in the world around us that can cause people to wonder, is God really there and is God really possessing the power to do anything about it? So um, I'm going to unmute you and give you an opportunity to respond. What are some of the things that, some of the forces at work that would cause us to question perhaps whether God's really on the throne? The obvious one today is the virus. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it is something beyond our control. It is something that at this point we have not been able, you know, the best minds have not been able to get a handle on how to, to deal with this, you know, to, to find the vaccine, to, to, uh, to really combat this. And on an individual level, it's something that is forcing changes upon us, that is causing our lives to be disrupted. And it makes us think, well, where's God in the midst of all of this? So that's, that is obviously one, you're right. What else? I thought about Hitler. Okay. Yeah. When you think about uh, things that have happened within the lifetime of some of uh, the people on this call, uh, when, when you think about world powers that have come and gone, 
uh, and you see the evil that some have done, uh, the, the reprehensible things that some individuals, some countries have done, and the injustice that's been perpetrated, and you think, okay, where is God in the midst of that? So the, again, that, you're right. That is something that causes some people to question. What else? Okay, Louise? Civil unrest. All right, civil unrest. Yeah, when we see anarchy, uh, division, and we see uh, hatred among uh, people within our own nation, it causes us to wonder. I'm wondering if some folks down uh, south of Corpus Christi might have been questioning yesterday uh, <laughs> when the wind started blowing uh, and the hurricane hit. Um, and when we see the forces of nature at work like that, it can cause some people to question. Uh, Janine, do you have something? Yeah, I think about children. You know, when you see children with cancer or the children in Africa who are starving to death, you know, a lot of people say, well, why does God allow that? Why does, you know, if there's a God, why doesn't he fix that? And, and it does make it hard. And I mean, and especially since I have friends who had a baby born with cancer, you know, when you're praying, you kind of want to say, God, what's, what's the point here? What's the, you know, what are you trying to tell us? You know, but a lot of people don't, uh, and, and we, we've all asked, what do, we, what do you want us to learn from Rush having cancer? But a lot of people don't see it that way. A lot of people see it as, well, if God was God, God wouldn't let that baby have cancer or God wouldn't let those kids starve around the world. All right. Well, th thank you. That's, that's obviously one that <clears throat> causes our hearts to, to break and to think, well, where is God in the midst of that? When we see the innocent who suffer. Well, in the verses that follow, we see a picture of God on the throne. We see the heavenly judgment. And as, I, as we look at this, I want us to think of the flip side of the question I just asked. We, we looked at those things that cause us to question uh, whether God is on the throne. What are some of the sources of assurance that we have that help us to remain confident, confident that, that God hasn't forgotten, that God hasn't forsaken his people? So as we look now at this picture of the heavenly judgment, verses 9 through 12, be thinking about that. Beginning in verse 9. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched them because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And as for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. We'll stop there and pick up in just a moment with the next part. As we, uh, as we think about this chapter, there's a lot of speculation about those first eight verses of this chapter. When we look at the four beasts, there's a lot of unanswered questions that we have there. But when it comes right down to it, that's not the focus of the vision. That's not the main idea of what Daniel is trying to get across. Here in the center, right in the middle of this chapter, this is where we find what's really important. Because here we, first of all, see a picture of the ancient of days, the, the one who is seated upon the throne. Daniel refers here to God as, the, this translation I read was the ancient one, others say the ancient of days. 
one who is seated on a throne of judgment. And the picture here is like a, a divine courtroom. Um, the idea of the ancient of days refers to the eternal nature of God, that he was from the beginning and that he will be forevermore, that he will rule everlastingly. There's no beginning and no ending with him. And every detail of his appearance as it's described here, the, the white robes, the hair that's uh, snow white, everything about that speaks of his purity, of his holiness, particularly when we think of it in contrast to the beasts that we've already read about, to these earthly kings who are described like animals. And then we see the heavenly king, the one who is enthroned in heaven, who is a picture of purity, a picture of righteousness, a picture of holiness. And the throne that's described is unusual because it talks there about its fiery wheels. So really what we're seeing here is a picture of this flaming chariot uh, that, that God is enthroned upon this, this chariot with its wheels aflame. It's a picture of God on the move, that God is not just distant and removed from where we are, but that he's all about what's going on in his creation and that nothing's escaping his notice. He is on the move in the midst of situations where we think, where is he? When we look at a child that's born with cancer, when we look at people who are starving, when we look at injustice occurring, when we look at situations that seem to be just anarchy. When we look at all of those things, we, we question, where is God? Well, this tells us God is on the move in the midst of it. We just don't always notice. We don't always see how God is at work there. But we have the assurance God is present and none of this is escaping his notice because the latter part of this talks about how the books are opened. The, the record of the evil that was committed by these beasts that have been described, by these uh, powerful forces in the world. We see how they're being held accountable for what they have said and what they have done, particularly for what they have done to God's people. And he particularly speaks of this fourth beast being slain and then burned with fire and talks about the arrogance of that little horn. Again, next week, we're going to talk more about Antiochus and how that fits. But uh, the picture here is of the beast having their power stripped from them. Talks about how the, the, some remained for a short time and then they were gone as well that basically their power was stripped from them. And even if they were still around, their days were numbered. And that's an important lesson, I think, for us. Because a lot of times we tend to think of the evil in our world as having the upper hand, as being dominant. But we know from the Gospels, we know from the story of Jesus, that Satan is a defeated foe. He's living on borrowed time. It's, his doom is already sealed. It's just, we're living in that in-between time. We're living in that in-between period and we're waiting for that final day of judgment when he will be held accountable as well. But the picture that we see is of God holding earthly powers accountable for the evil that they have done, particularly for all that they have done to, to hurt God's covenant people, the, the faithful people of God. 
So what are some of the circumstances that Daniel and the, the exiles would have, uh, would have looked at and might have asked, well, okay, where is God in the middle of this? You know, how, how can we really see God as being in control in the middle of what we're going through? What would, what would be some of the things that they saw that would cause them to question this? For some reason, I'm unmuting all, and I'm just unmuting most. <laughs> but uh, go ahead. Uh, anybody that, that is unmuted, check. Uh, what were some of the things that Daniel and, and his contemporaries would have been seeing that would might have caused them to ask if God really was on the throne? I think a very disheartening thing would be that, I mean, God allowed his people to be uprooted and pulled off into captivity. That would be a, like, whoa, that would seem like the thing he wouldn't allow to happen. Yes, so. absolutely. Yeah, these were God's people. And the fact that they were uprooted, that they were taken from that land that God had promised to them and now are having to live in Babylon. And even if they could accept the idea that, well, okay, my grandfather, <laughs> he messed up. And so, yeah, all right, it was punishment. And so he had to endure this. But what about the kids that were born in Babylon? <laughs> you know, it's, it's been a while now. Uh, and they're thinking, what did I do to deserve this? Why are we still here? Why are we still stuck in this situation? Uh, why are we having to go through this? So I, I think you're right. That would have been a big one. What else? Right, Louise? Having to find a slave. I, I couldn't hear all of that. You're kind of cutting in now. Having to serve as, as slaves and workmen rather than being in control. Okay. The fact that they no longer had as much freedom as they had enjoyed back home. Uh, they were a captive <laughs> people. Granted, Babylonian captivity wasn't nearly as bad as it had been back in Egypt when they were really slaves. Uh, it wasn't as bad as uh, other times in their history, but still, it wasn't home, and it wasn't the range of choices that they were accustomed to. They, they were not being able to do what they wanted to do, where they wanted to do it, and they had to, um, I think, ask, where is God in the middle of this? Well, we've already talked about in our own lives, in our own time, some of the things that cause people to ask, well, you know, where is God in the middle of this? But here we see a picture that, yeah, God is on the move. <clears throat> God is on the move. God is going to hold people accountable for the evil that they do, particularly for those who are persecuting God's people. Uh, so what are the sources of assurance that we have that help us remain confident that God hasn't forsaken us, that God hasn't turned his back on his people? What are some of the, the assurances that we find that help us to get through these questions? God's promises. going to rain. I'm sorry, what? Uh, sorry. Janine, go ahead. You, you say I just first. said that in the end, God's going to reign and he's right. going to conquer. Okay. All right. Exactly. Uh, Frank, what were you going to say? About God's promises in his word that right. he's going to take care of it. That we're in his hands. Okay. The promises that we have in the scripture. Right. Louise. On a day to day basis, waking up and seeing the sunshine and seeing answers to specific prayers and just, just knowing that he's beside me. It's, you know. All right, just day to day, recognizing <laughs> that every breath we draw is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Every new day that he gives us is a gift from him. And, and then, like you were saying, 
looking back in our own lives and in the lives of people that we know and love, times when we just knew God was there, God was doing things that were beyond us. And at those moments, we were so certain that, that God was present. We need to keep that in mind. When we go through the, the dry times, the times when maybe it's not quite as readily apparent uh, that God's just pouring out the blessings. You know, the, the showers of blessings are coming a little, uh, you know, kind of drought. But, uh, but we can remember that God has been faithful. And if he has been, he will be. If he has heard our prayers in the past, he's going to continue to hear them. And we have that word from his scripture, just like Frank was saying, he will never leave us nor forsake us. We have the promises of his word to uh, help us get through the challenging times. Well, moving on, we see another picture that is really at the heart of this vision, and that is the idea of the son of man. So let's look at verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> beginning in verse 13 as I watched in the night visions I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven and he came to the ancient one and was presented before him to him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all people's nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. This particular translation describes this one as uh, being like a human being. Uh, and that's true. That is part of the idea here. But I think the, the more common translation of this, the son of man, uh, brings it home a little clearer to us exactly what this is talking about and who this is talking about. This particular vision, the vision of the Son of Man coming in the clouds, uh, is one that, that captured the imagination of the Jews in that time after Daniel received this vision and in the decades and centuries that followed. It's this picture of one that God has granted dominion to, dominion and glory and kingdom to this son of man who all people and nations and languages will serve. It's the, there's really two ideas here. And, and both were interpreted uh, by the Jews in different ways at different times. One is the, what this translation seems to suggest. The idea of the Son of Man is sort of this corporate representative of the people of the covenant, that he's one of us. You know, he's, he's one of us, um, or at least the faithful remnant of that covenant people, those who remain true to God. Uh, and, and in fact, well, as we go on, we're going to read in verse 25 about the saints of the Most High. And so there we see that corporate identity at work here. But then there's also that specific application. And this is what the Jews came to cling to a whole lot more in the days ahead when they began to understand this is talking about the promised one. This is that Messiah, the anointed one that we have to look forward to. This is the one that God is going to bring as our deliverer, as our rescuer. He's the one that we can look to. And as we think about the Gospels, as we think about the story of Jesus, Son of Man was the term that Jesus applied to himself more than any other. In fact, he, we see that that particular phrase used more than 80 times in the Gospels. And when Jesus said this, at different times and different places, 
he was using both of these ideas to, to, uh, to bring it together. Uh, on the one hand, he is referring to himself as son of man, as his way of saying, I am one of you. Uh, I'm going through what you're going through. I relate to what you're experiencing. Uh, it's that picture of, of God with us, that God is experiencing us, uh, life alongside of us. And so that was Jesus' way of identifying with the people. But also, Dan Daniel, uh, this picture from Daniel was also in Jesus' mind because he referred to that on more than one occasion. In fact, when he was brought before the, the authorities, just before his crucifixion, he specifically cited this passage. Uh, and he was making it clear that he was the one that Daniel was talking about. He was the one that the people had been waiting for. He was that anointed one of God. So whatever ambiguity, whatever questions there may be surrounding some aspects of Daniel's vision, what's clear is that this kingdom that is given to the Son of Man is everlasting and it will never be destroyed. While all of these other kingdoms that are described in this vision are going to pass, there's one that's going to last. And that's the idea we come down to in verses 15 through 28 about kings and kingdoms. Starting in verse 15 and then reading down through the end of the chapter. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretations of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. And I desired to know the truth concerning this fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which he devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And concerning the 10 horns that were on its head and concerning the other horn that came up to make room for, which the, for the three which fell out, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly and that seemed greater than the others. And as I looked, this horn made war with the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the ancient one came. Then judgment was given for the holy ones of the most high and the time arrived when the holy ones gained possession of the kingdom. This is what he said. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth that'll be different from all the other kingdoms and it'll devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And as for the 10 horns out of this kingdom, 10 kings will rise and another shall arise after them. This one will be different from the former ones and will put down the three kings. He'll speak words against the most high and shall wear out the holy ones of the most high. And shall attempt to change the sacred seasons and the law and they'll be given unto his power for a time and two times and a half a time. And the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion will be taken away to be consumed and totally destroyed. The kingship and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under this, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the most high. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them. And here the account ends. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly terrified me. My face turned pale but I kept the matter in my mind. This passage provides further details about the judgment of this fourth beast, particularly this little horn that is described uh, and that wages war against the people of God. Again, next week in particular, we're going to be looking at a, a specific prophecy regarding uh, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, 
who flagrantly blasphemed the God of the Jews and, and did everything imaginable to, to desecrate their worship place and to stamp out all of the practices that they had that made them a, a peculiar people that set them apart as the distinctive people of God. And these were all events that then ended up triggering the, the Maccabean revolt. And some look at this passage and say that not only did it refer to that one, but there's a future fulfillment in the, the end of time, uh, something comparable to this. And again, a lot of questions arise concerning all of that, but what we find that is certain in the midst of this, in the midst of the, the things that are still open to interpretation that defy easy understanding on our part is that assurance of the ultimate defeat of any power, any principality that sets itself against God and against the saints of God. So as we think about this passage, as we think about this vision of Daniel, it raises a whole lot of questions for us, but it also gives us certain assurances. Rather than being frustrated by what we can't know for certain, we need to focus on what God makes abundantly clear for us. God is not removed from human history. Rather, God is sovereign over it. God is not going to forsake his people. God is there in the midst of whatever his people are experiencing. Evil is not going to go unpunished forever. Judgment is certain. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, like the song says, but there is a kingdom that is everlasting, and that is the kingdom of God, and God reigns. That kingdom of God, remember, is whenever and wherever God's perfect will is done, where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, where God's sovereignty is fully realized. That's why Jesus said when he came, when he began his earthly ministry, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is near. That idea that if you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like, right here, this is it. I'm it. A life fully surrendered to the will of God. A life fully obedient to the will of God the Father. That's the kingdom. Jesus came to inaugurate that kingdom. We see that in his earthly ministry. We see it really uh, put into place with his crucifixion and resurrection because there we see him exalted, that he is not left as a dead martyr, but he is exalted to a place uh, of sovereignty where God is saying, yes, this is the one who's going to reign forever and ever. And it points to that time, that day when God will set all things right. Because really, when we look at the resurrection of Jesus, that was the beginning of the new creation. That was the beginning of what we see in the very last chapter of Revelation, that the new heaven and the new earth, that, uh, that time when God's going to make everything right again, when everything that sin has destroyed, everything that sin has damaged and distorted will be done away with, and heaven and earth will be one. That time when God's going to make everything right, that is what we see beginning on the first day that day of resurrection. And that's really what Daniel is pointing toward here. The, the kingdom of God, that everlasting kingdom that we have to look forward to. So as we, as we think about the things that we've looked at here in Daniel's prophecy, things that were, would have been discouraging, 
things that would have been frightening. We also see this word of assurance that whatever's going on, whatever beasts come out of the chaos, whatever powers seem to be prevailing in our world, God's still on the throne. God's still in control. And God will bring things to the proper conclusion in his good time. God has not forsaken his people. So what, what thoughts do you have about this? Uh, anything maybe that we uh, looked at in this passage that you'd like to comment on? Anything? Okay. I, oh. I always have something to say. Um, it, it just occurs to me that throughout the scriptures, there are times when uh, the, the scriptures will say uh, he didn't under, somebody didn't understand something because God closed his eyes to it or, or closed his mind to it. And I think it's important for us to realize that God is going to give us what we need when we need it. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. We don't have to understand everything all the time. <laughs> it, God doesn't, God's not giving us an understanding of everything because we don't need it at this point. But there will come a time when we need that truth and God will make it clear to us. So that, that's a good point, Louise. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you for being part of this this morning. Uh, Kevin, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer, please? I, I will. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just we thank you for, for this word, Lord, and, and we thank you for the reminder not to, not to get bogged down in the, in the details of things, Lord, that we, we just lift up our eyes and look at the, look at the big picture, that, that you are on the throne. You are holy Amen. and you are in control. Lord, help us to just help us to keep our minds on that fact uh, as we go out into this life with with our new version of the beast, Lord, with the with the corona stalking the land, Lord. We just we ask that you you keep us in your will, Lord. Help us to look to you daily and just we, we thank you for the blessings in our life. In your holy son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good to see everybody this morning. You all too. See some of you at the service just a little while. Others joining us uh, on Facebook. And uh, see you next week. See you next week. Bye bye. bye, -bye.